You have just heard the voice of a person who actually committed suicide. The telephone call was received at one of the 90 suicide prevention centers recently established in the United States. I am Dr. Stanley Yolis, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health in Chevy Chase, Maryland. It is my pleasure to introduce this first training record in suicidology relating to the accurate assessment of and appropriate response to suicidal cries for help that involve the use of the telephone. In it, we illustrated some important principles and precepts involved in the telephone response to suicidal crisis situations. It is our hope that this training record will provide a stimulus for further thought, discussion, and especially for the saving of lives. I am now pleased to introduce the chief of the NIMH Center for Studies of Suicide Prevention, Dr. Edwin S. Schneidman. It is not easy to state accurately what a typical suicidal call is like. The preceding telephone conversation was not meant to illustrate an average or typical call, but rather it was presented as an example of a serious call with some real potentiality for lethal outcome and at the same time containing the characteristic ambivalence between living and dying that identifies almost every suicidal individual's dialogue with death. The contact to a suicide prevention agency is definitely a cry for help. The suicide prevention worker in this instance is faced with the most challenging opportunity namely the chance to save a life in balance. The remainder of this record is made up of a number of genuine telephone calls. As part of the presentation of the first call, I shall interpolate with some interpretive, clinical observations and theoretical comments. In general, two guiding principles will shape these observations. First, some analysis of the process in the dyad between the worker and the caller, especially the shifts and changes in the caller's attitudes, ambivalence, and lethality as they relate to the responses of the worker. Second, the notion of lethality itself, that is, the assessment by the worker of how suicidal the caller is, the probability of his killing himself. A suicide prevention worker needs to assess the lethality of each call in order to know how quickly and how deeply he has to move. The worker attempts to accomplish two ends, to evaluate the lethality of the call and simultaneously to influence, specifically to reduce, that lethality. Briefly stated, Overall lethality is rated in terms of the caller's suicidal plan, the resources felt by the caller to be of to him, the nature of the crisis experienced by the caller, his recent medical, psychological, and suicidal history, and the stability of his character and personality in general. One interesting way of actively listening to this training record is to stop the record by lifting the needle from the record after each caller's response 
and then to attempt to formulate what you, as a suicide prevention worker, might have said at that point, and then to think about or discuss in a group the relative merits of your response compared with what actually occurred on the record. The purpose of this record, of course, is to stimulate discussion of both theory and practice of suicide prevention to the end of more effective life saving. It is hoped that the record will serve these functions. Now, let us turn to the next call in which the voice of the caller has been reenacted. Hello? Can you offer anything to someone on Skid Row or should he just die? How old are you? This is a very interesting response by the worker, which points out that one need not always answer a question posed by the caller. The response completely disregards the question and permits the worker immediately to assert the helper's role. All right, I'm the director of the Suicide Prevention Center here. Can you tell me what uh, the nature is of the problem? The worker then says in this response, you have come to the right person. I am competent. I can help you. What's the trouble? Well, I'm 27 years old and in good health. I was up to three uh, years ago a uh, public relations. For the past three years, I've gone through a wife, uh, about eight jobs. For a young man, it usually takes alcohol to go down that path. Is that what's been with you? Alcohol, women, gambling, you name it, I've had it. I tried alcoholism, I've tried religion, I've tried the works. I've tried missions, they, they don't work. I've tried the AA, it doesn't work. You tell me, if you can think of one good, sane reason. Uh, I tried uh, psychiatry? Well, let's face it, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm a man that's just about barely able to make his own living. It's rather difficult to go to a psychiatrist unless you go to a, well, I spent a couple of weeks in a mental hospital and that doesn't impress me very much. That was for, for, for uh, drinking and a number of... Suicide attempts? N no. No? Have you ever done anything to yourself? Self-destructive action? Well, once I had a fight with my wife, but it wasn't... Uh, it was uh, not uh, a suicide attempt. It was just a... Uh, I don't know what the heck it was. What did you do? I went across my wrist with a rather sharp knife, but devil, I should have known where my own radial artery was. I probably were ambivalent about the, the thing, and uh, still in a relationship with your wife and all. Uh, do you have any children? One. But that was, as I say, a few years ago, and... But where, where is that child now? We're, we're divorced. The, the thing is finished. It's, it's been finished for three years. It's... Uh, okay. well, how, how long have you been here? Oh, about three weeks now, and I've been getting by on different kinds of labor. Any able-bodied man is certainly not going to go without a place to sleep or, 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 or a meal or anything like that in, in a major city. But that's not the reason. The reason is what, a, what I see in front of me is just quite a few more years of the same as, as I've had, and that doesn't look very good. Wasn't any of this uh, fun? Weren't any kicks and all this uh, gambling, women and all that? Yeah, there were kicks, but 99% of the time I was struggling for existence and was living in sleazy hotels, hungover, uh, doing work far beneath my, my talent. So far beneath what I should be doing, living like a dog. I'm, I'm, a li I'm li living like a dog right now. Oh, you need some help. Uh, I can see that. How, how did you get in touch with us or hear about us? Well, uh, I uh, again, I, I've heard about uh, that, 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 that there are cities, uh, uh, things this type. Uh, I just looked it up in the telephone directory. Mm -hmm. But mainly it's just, uh, I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with me mentally. Maybe I'm crazy, but I, I don't go around doing things insane. I haven't been arrested in the past three years for anything. But as I say, a, a man, 27 years old, and I'm living the life of a, well, I, I know... Uh, what I know, winos and skid rows are, that are, that are uh, pro probably happier than I am right now. I, I don't see any other choice. If you can tell me one possible other choice, why I would be, I would be happy to hear it. No one likes to end his own life, but I'm faced with, well, many, many more years of the same stuff, and I'm sick of it. And even the kicks I've had, 
I couldn't even have fun going out and drinking. Uh -huh. uh, sex, anything there for you? Well, what little, little, uh, little uh, there is of it left. The last lengthy affair I had with a girl in Philadelphia, but that came to an end because it was impossible to make a living in Philadelphia for anybody, really. I left and then we lost touch. She was a girl from, I would say she was an ex-prostitute, but she was probably the finest girl I ever met. I wouldn't say ex. She's probably practicing her trade again. I know how much I certainly didn't do her any good at all. Well, you say you're not uh, insane. You certainly aren't, but you apparently you have a pattern of uh, drifting from place to place, a lot of changes. What kind of a life do you come from, a family life that you grew up in? Well, my father was, uh, well, he was jailed a number of times for drinking too much. My earliest recollection was in court when they got legally separated. The court ordered him to go into the service. He made a career out of it. And of course, they take out an allotment. My mother, well, she and I never did get along. I have a brother, well, even now. He is the only person that even knows my whereabouts, and I, uh, I, I think he'd prefer not to. But he has a certain sense of duty to the family, and he helped me out of scrapes before, and I can't let, uh, well, I can't, I can't allow my brother to keep pulling me out of scrapes. My, my mother drinks, and, well, I'm not going to be a judge of her, but every time I visit her when I was back home working, she was either drunk or hungover, but that's only been the last few years. Here the caller gives an important early memory of traumatic parental loss, and now one has a hint as to what he is seeking. The caller and his mother never got along, and he was psychologically orphaned at an early age. He's clearly giving us the psychodynamics of his present condition. But what am I faced with? My last city I was in, I had a good job, and on the other side of the ledger, I was a bum on Skid Row for a few months, too. They were quite happy with me at work, but just, I just, just one day up and left. Here the caller talks about his impulsiveness. This impulsiveness is something which the worker will have to keep in mind. For no good reason at all. For no good reason at all. Just tired of uh, the responsibility or tired of the work or monotonous or boring, something like that? I don't really know, except that that was the problem. One day I decided not to go to, to work, and then that, and that was that. They were happy with me. In fact, they were thinking of promoting me, and things were looking very bright for me. But I just seemed to be missing myself out of things. I haven't done much here, but I could. But what good would it do me? You just get yourself so far and then you probably quit or get back into mess. Yeah, and on the other hand, if uh, someone were to say, well, here's a job for you, we will take care of you until you make uh, payday or uh, and everything like that, I, I would probably, uh, I would probably last about six or seven weeks on it. It happened before, maybe at the very outside two or three months, and then whammo. Well, now, are you, uh, what sort of, uh, method of injuring yourself do you have in mind? What would you do to yourself? Swim out as far as I can or climb to a high place and go off. So I, I don't know. Maybe I would check it out, but I don't think so. Because maybe I, I can't, uh, I, I can't uh, see any further hope. Right now you're in town here and there's nobody that knows you and nobody cares? Is that the situation? I haven't got one person in this city, in the United States of America, in the entire world that gives one good well, one good rap, whether I live or die, except from a professional stand. You might say, well, that is the main reason why I haven't given you my last name or exact location, because I dare say the police would be interested in stopping me. But that is their job. Yeah, that's true. Uh... You might be interested in preventing my demise, but again, this is your job. But what I'm trying to find out is that is there one good reason why I should? Well, uh, the good reason, you know, that I, the only one good reason, is the possibility that uh, you have got a mental illness of a sort or a severe neurosis uh, rising out of your confused and unstable background and that you could stabilize yourself and uh, get some uh, uh, more uh, pleasure out of life and some self-respect. That'd be your, uh, the only thing. Well, how do you lick something like that? Okay, you're young, a little older. Uh, Let me ask you about the way your thoughts go now. You're thinking, what the hell, there's no use. Do you feel, is there a lot of guilt, 
Using the caller's intelligence, his good vocabulary, and other resources, turns to the possibility of psychotherapy, making it the in thing to do for a person like the caller. And and I also I I feel that psychotherapy, and maybe I'm wrong, is suggestion more than anything else, and uh, I I'm just not that suggestible. Well, you know, some pretty. <laughs> Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Therapy has been, uh, actually, it, it's geared to the uh, uh, capacity and the need of the person who is uh, having the therapy for uh, many types of people. Therapy is a chance to clear, clear their mind and uh, get a chance to get some distance from their own problem and analyze it with an attitude uh, free of some of the complications that you have. You got. We do have quite a bit of guilt and quite a bit of self-criticism, and I imagine that does complicate trying to analyze your problem. Well, well an I... indefinable thing should be more clearly definable. I have tried to apply all the intelligence that I have to, to finding out just exactly what was wrong with me and, 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 and correcting it. I, I have had every break in the world, and here I am, flat on my tail. In other words, oh, I am... I still am well dressed. I managed to get a few days' work in, but for all practical purposes, broke and without any place to go and save. With the choice between going back to Skid Row or taking my own life, I, I think if uh, in uh, if you had the choice, well, if you had the choice, what would you choose? Well, um, there seems to be more to it than that. I'd say there's a lot more to the to your uh, life than just those. Uh, as long as you assume that you're stuck in your pattern, then I suppose that's the only two choices you have. But to me, you know, viewing it as an outsider, I think it's just ridiculous that a guy should be stuck in his pattern. I've seen so many people blast themselves loose from their pattern so many times that uh, it uh, is a matter of, of uh, often of uh, understanding your pattern and taking a, and getting some distance from your anxiety so you can uh, see where you, you put the uh, proper effort to change it, change the pattern. Here the worker accomplishes a very important task. He widens the range of choices from, going back to the very beginning of the interview, the choice between skid row or death, he now widens the range within life itself in saying that there is much more than these two choices and the problem is to get unstuck from a choice of a terrible life or an unwanted death. How? Oh, I 
can't see. Uh, well, I, I should say something like that. Here we get four, five, six calls a day from people like yourself, and all co sorts of people in, in trouble. In, the, in your case, you're, you're the kind of a situation here which, uh, which is enormous uh, resources. We really run into people who are at the end of their rope, older people, sick people, unhealthy people. You, you're a, what you are is a healthy neurotic, just like all the rest of us, only your pattern is one that uh, society doesn't reward at all. And so your, uh, your self-destructive pattern some people with a neurosis, like maybe your brother, overwork, and they get ulcers later in life, but they have money. Uh, I'd say that you need outpatient therapy for your neurosis, and uh, I'd suggest you come on in and talk with me to start it out. How does a skid row bum get psychotherapy? Now let's uh, discuss that. Uh, take one step at a time. The caller came to the Suicide Prevention Center the next day and short-term psychotherapy was begun. As a summary comment, the rating of lethality in this case is lower at the end of the interview than at the beginning because the promise for life is higher. What is to be noted is that the worker did not engage in philosophic discussions with the caller, that he answered some of his questions by avoiding answering them at all, that he developed the caller's background, his strengths, that he empathized with him, he remained professional, and offered a program for action and for help. This is side two of the training record in suicidology. On it, portions of telephone calls to three different suicide prevention centers are presented. We are especially fortunate to have had a recording of the presentations made in March 1968 at the first annual conference on suicidology by its senior statesman, Dr. Jacques Sharon, Louis I. Dublin, Lawrence Kuby, Carl Menninger, Erwin Stengel, and from an earlier lecture at the Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Center, Dr. Henry A. Murray. In this record, we have, with their permission, juxtaposed excerpts from their general comments to one case where it was felt that these comments had special relevance and would be didactically illuminating. The first case on this side of the record, call number three, is of a 29-year-old divorced woman who has cut herself and who, after talking for a while to a worker, when the suggestion of Medicaid is pushed, hangs up the telephone. Dr. Dublin. The lay volunteer was probably the most important single discovery in the 50-year history of suicide prevention. He had the time and the qualities of character to prove that he cared. With proper training, he can make a successful approach to the client and by his knowledge of the community services which are available for useful referral, he can often tide his client over his crisis. Stay where? 
Dr. Murray. I was thinking of a variety of psychic states characterized by a marked diminution or cessation of affect involving both hemispheres of concern, the inner and the outer world. It is as if the person's primal spring of vitality had dried up, or as if he were empty or hollow at the very core of his being. There is a striking absence of anything but the most perfunctory and superficial social interactions. Output as well as intake is at a minimum. To him, the human species is wholly uninviting and unlovable, a monotonous round of unnecessary duplicates. Trying to go to college, trying to raise the kids, making a very mess of it. Very, very mess of it. Where is your daddy? It's my problem, not theirs. Sure, you have to have a father. Most of them do. I don't know of any. No, no, I've been divorced for years. I don't. Dr. Cuby. To assume that every act of self-injury has self-extinction as its goal is a serious fallacy. Sometimes both the conscious and unconscious goals may be precisely the reverse. For example, patients not infrequently are released from hospital care before they are ready for this. When it happens, they struggle desperately to return to the hospital. If the hospital becomes obstinate and defensive and dismisses the patient's appeal as manifestation of hospitalism or dependency, the desperation increases, increases until the patient may take overdoses of medication. Such efforts are not efforts to die but to live. This is only one example of many similar errors which are made if one assumes that every patient who injures himself was planning to kill himself. Many of the examples are much subtler. When such an effort fails to succeed, it becomes possible to subject the patient to intensive retrospective study, thus to determine what the real motives have been. Unfortunately, such patients are not studied often enough or intensively enough. But when they are studied, a wide range of conscious and unconscious and pre-conscious goals comes to light. Mm -hmm. Did you cut a vein? No. I go. Maybe you tried this before, you know. Oh, yeah. I wish I had the guts to do it all the way. What do you think that gal gets you? Uh, I'm getting me out of it. Dr. Menninger. I think it's important to distinguish between suicide as a form of death and suicide as an attempted expression of something within one. Helplessness, desperation, fear, and the other emotions. Anything rather than suicide, anything rather than have to give up the most precious thing of all, namely my life. Sickness, yes, even neurosis, even crime, but not that awful oblivion, that awful ultimate nothing. 
A suicidal gesture is thus a cry, not only of distress, not only a cry for help, not only a prayer, one might say, but it is a pleading. I want to live. Help me to find a way to live. Mm -hmm. I, I never can decide whether it would really get me out of it. Ain't this something worse? I think it would get me out of it. I keep thinking that, you know, children, they can't accept their children. They can't accept their parents going away and leaving them. You're right. They can't. But there's one thing they can't accept. Children can accept that. Uh, I don't know. Dr. Sharon. Not sufficient attention has been paid to the difference between the death of another person, even of a loved one, and what I could call my own death. My death is something entirely different than the death of another person. For a therapist who deals with a potentially suicidal patient or who is uh, talking about the notions of death of the patient uh, may help to um, re-establish communication uh, between the patient and the therapist. It may also have diagnostic value in the sense that it may help us to establish the lethality of the patient. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of the My, 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 uh, they couldn't help it. My mother, they couldn't help it. Uh, because my mother died, you know, so they can accept it. But if their mother goes away and just, you know, goes away, but they can't accept that. Suppose your children knew how you died. Wouldn't that make a difference? Dr. Stengel. I think that uh, if one speaks in terms of con the concepts of death, uh, we must uh, consider the difference between what normal death does to other people and what suicidal death does to other people. Oh, no. Could they accept that? Who's my mother Dr. Murray. Whose outburst of grades showed that a volume, a volcano of resentful passion had been simmering all along beneath that crust of emotional inertia. What had once looked like an apathetic indifference to the surrounding world, an all-pervasive ennui, could now be more dynamically understood as an alternative to murder, namely ostracism of mankind, contrived by an unforgiving heart that had been turned to stone by experiencing an intolerable offense. Your mother? Did he you live with your mother? No. God, no. I can't stand my mother. Dr. Stengel. The psychoanalytic contribution to suicide research has been mainly concerned with the intrapsychic dynamics of self-destructive tendencies. This has been both its strength and its limitation. It has until recently not concerned itself with the external world, apart from those objects which by introjection become parts of the inner world. Zilberg's discovery of the role of the broken home in suicide proneness was a brilliant observation deduced from the study of intrapsychic processes and confirmed by clinical and epidemiological studies. Can I ask you something about that blood? That's bothering me. You think we ought to get a hold of a doctor or something? Oh, not to that point yet. How do you know? Well, I've been through it before. Yeah, but, you know, if you're bleeding all over the place, don't you think we better get a doctor? 
get you taken care of, cleaned up. Uh, it, it is a very uh, complex and uh, at times rather uh, tricky and dangerous uh, activity uh, for people who are not skilled in handling human relations. And uh, it is one of the functions of the uh, courses they have uh, from doctors and sociologists to uh, improve their knowledge and skill in this uh, particular area. Call number five is from a man in his 30s weeping in the anguish of his loneliness. What is to be noted especially is how the worker quickly and effectively gives the caller permission to talk and to cry and then helps him in his own way to tell his story and to unburden himself of his feelings. This call also contains within it that special and sometimes terrifying situation faced sooner or later by every suicide prevention worker, the problem of a suicidal person with a gun. The optimal handling of this problem should be one of the main topics in the discussion of this excerpt.
Later in this interview, the caller was persuaded to come in person to the Suicide Prevention Center and to bring his gun unloaded with him. The appropriate role of the suicide prevention worker is to contribute his skills, compassions, and energies on the side of life. Call number five is from a man in his 30s weeping in the anguish of his loneliness. What is to be noted especially is how the worker quickly and effectively gives the caller permission to talk and to cry and then helps him in his own way to tell his story and to unburden himself of his feelings. This call also contains within it that special and sometimes terrifying situation faced sooner or later by every suicide prevention worker, the problem of a suicidal person with a gun. The optimal handling of this problem should be one of the main topics in the discussion of this excerpt. Later in this interview, the caller was persuaded to come in person 
to the suicide prevention center and to bring his gun unloaded with him. The appropriate role of the suicide prevention worker is to contribute his skills, compassions, and energies on the side of life. 